There is now so much satellite imagery available, at least for some regions, that it can be challenging to decide which images to choose. This video, developed as part of the iGET project, explores the sequence of decisions inherent in the selection of images. The fundamental questions that determine which imagery to consider are simply, are you primarily interested in changes triggered by a particular event, or are you studying landscape change over time? Obviously, if your research is focused on a particular event, you can initially narrow your image choices down to one just before and another just after. I suggest initially specifying about a month before and a month after, so that at least a few scenes, but not too many, can be considered. Having done this, though, you will then have to work through the same issues that have to be confronted in a more complex analysis as illustrated over the next few minutes, and those issues may well require revising your acceptable dates somewhat. For example, I am interested in images from just before and after the May 25, 2014 Salt Creek mudslide in western Colorado. As evident here, the image from three days before is obviously not useful due to considerable cloud cover. But images from weeks or months earlier are even less likely to be useful due to higher probability of both cloud and snow cover. So, an image from the year before is actually most useful. Note that in the web resolution JPEG overlay copied here, you cannot zoom in enough to see the detailed scene well, only that it is a clear, cloud-free image. In the actual downloaded scene, though, you would be able to distinguish ground features such as the slide scar. Studying change, for example urban expansion or deforestation or cropland expansion over several decades, however, requires taking additional factors into consideration. To illustrate these issues, I'll discuss a study I'm currently working on of the growth since the early 1980s of the city of Lloydminster a city that lies on the border between two Canadian provinces, Alberta and Saskatchewan, that have different policies that influence the oil and gas economy, here illustrated with these two Google Earth screenshots. If your focus is on changes in forest or other vegetation in a temperate climate, make sure you take the seasons into consideration from the outset. Not doing so could easily lead you to conclude that there has been significant forest loss when in fact you are primarily detecting differences between spring and summer greenness or canopy cover. So in vegetation studies it is crucial to select images from as close to the same date each year as you can. In my study I anticipate that the differences between newly urbanized areas and farmland will be much easier to detect with strong contrasts between vegetated and non-vegetated areas so I've narrowed my search to summer scenes only. Similarly, if significant differences in rain or snowfall from one year to the next could also be confused with permanent or long-term vegetation change, then you would need to select the years carefully as well. This clearly requires good familiarity with your study region and likely some prior research. Once you have decided on the most appropriate date range, you are ready to search for available images, or scenes, of your study area. To search for these images, it is helpful to begin by learning the correct Worldwide Reference System, or WRS, path and row designation for the scene that includes your study area. The way I prefer to do this, though there are other ways, is to begin at the Global Visualization website, whose URL and start screen are shown here, which allows users to zoom in on an area of interest and then see its path row designation. Here I have already used the Glovis map to identify a location somewhere near my study area, but with the viewer at its coarsest or zoomed out resolution, I can't yet see if I'm really in the right spot, so I'm about to zoom in by changing the map resolution. And while I'm at it, I like to turn on the cities and roads layers so I can confidently identify my study area. You can also fine-tune the display using the Move buttons which adjust the view one scene at a time. A recent scene including my study area is now displayed in the viewer and the scene's path and row designation is displayed. The fuzziness of the scene depicted here is an issue that will be considered later. 
You can continue to search for images from different time periods and prepare to download them, but at this point I prefer to switch to the Earth Explorer site. Once you log in to the Earth Explorer website, you can enter the Path Row designators, click Show, and the map will quickly display the region featured in that scene. You can further zoom in and pan around the scene to focus on a study area, though you don't have to for the search to work. While it is possible to search for scenes by place names or lat long coordinates, I find it faster to use the WRS designation. Once the map adjusts to your specified path row values, you can then narrow the search by a date range that reflects your research interests. I find it more satisfactory to search for one short period at a time, since searching the whole study period at once will often produce hundreds of results, which I find overwhelming. Here I have specified a year range that includes the first available Landsat 5 imagery for this area, and limited the search to the summer months I believe will be most fruitful for analysis. Next, click on the Data Sets tab to specify the particular sensor, or satellite, from which you want images. While the Earth Explorer site allows you to explore and download many types of data, here I'm only interested in the Landsat image archive, so I have expanded that submenu to see a list of sensor options. I've selected the Landsat 4 and 5 thematic mapper since I know that for the early 1980s that's the only option. Then click on Results and the site will process the request. I quickly see the thumbnails of all the results displayed. Seven scenes fit my search parameters and I can now explore these results in various ways. Visually scanning the thumbnails of the results, displaying the footprint of an image, or showing a browse overlay to see a scene displayed on the map. Here it is clear that clouds obscure much of the area in several scenes. Number four looks potentially useful, it's mostly cloud free, so I've displayed its browse overlay to examine it more closely, but now I see that it's actually of the scene to the east and only includes part of my study area. It's also from a few weeks later than I really want, so I'm going to select the one image that does not have cloud cover and fits my time parameters better. Result number six is a wonderfully cloud-free image from July 25, 1984. So I'm going to select it for download by clicking on the Download Options icon, then select the Level 1 product as shown here. Downloading will begin immediately in many cases, but expect it to take a while even on a fast connection, since these scenes are about one gigabyte in size. Note that I had originally intended to use images from the start of each decade. The discovery that the best first image is from 1984 makes me start to think about redefining my study parameters to match the available data. The problem of cloud cover is obviously a major consideration, as we saw earlier, when five of the first seven potential scenes were unusable. While I have presented this issue here as a late consideration in the decision process, you really need to consider it from the beginning, as some seasons are simply cloudier than others. But, as we've seen, clouds are often problematic even during what we think are the best seasons. Rather than just leave it till the results phase to eliminate cloudy scenes, you can set a maximum cloud cover filter earlier. Here I've gone back clicked on the Additional Criteria button and set a maximum cloud cover of less than 30% and repeated the previous search. With the cloud filter on, there are only three results, but even so, one is not useful as my study area is partially obscured, even though the rest of the scene is relatively cloud-free. Indeed, cloud cover often forces a next best choice, even when you've thought a lot about it ahead of time. The final consideration is of most significance for more recent years. Differences in the wavelength bands acquired by the different satellites and how those bands are numbered. This is not a reason to reject images necessarily, but it is an additional analysis consideration, so if you can use images from the same satellite, I would. Differences in the spatial resolution of images between the earliest Landsat sensors and the later ones is a major consideration and a reason that many studies begin with images from the 1980s.
Here are results from my search for all July or August images with less than 30% cloud cover between June 2009 and September 2014 from any of the four different sensors that could have acquired images during this time period. Note that the results are shown for just one sensor at a time. In this figure, the Landsat 5 options. One of these images would work. But since I know there may be options from more recently launched satellites, I'm going to explore those results further before making my decision. Here the display shows Landsat 7 results, but now we see an additional issue. Only part of the image is useful due to the scan line correction problem, a malfunction in the satellite since 2003. While most of my study area looks to be within the central strip of useful, corrected scan, you may not be so lucky. For my study, a 2014 Landsat 8 image is just as suitable as one from 2010 and means I don't have to worry about the scan line correction problem, so that's what I'll use. In fact, since I now know I have good images for 1984 and 2014, I'll now search for 1994 and 2004 images, and then change the title and other aspects of my study accordingly. So, having considered seasonality as it pertains to both vegetation and cloud cover, and my ability to distinguish between urban and rural areas over several decades, eliminated some results due to cloud cover and SLC problems, I've narrowed my search down to four scenes which I will then process and use in a supervised classification to analyze urbanization over 30 years. I think that if you follow this decision flow chart, Narrowing down your Landsat scene options will be fairly quick and soon become second nature. Please check out additional remote sensing resources at the iGET website as well as other tutorials on our YouTube channel. The final section of this video consists of comprehension questions. My answers are found in the next five slides and I suggest that you simply pause the video as needed to view the questions and answers.